Thank you for joining today. Um, we are here to learn about assistive technology uh, now and tomorrow. Um, my name is Corey Cooper. Uh, this is Tyler Shrink. Um, this is a, uh, a course that we have done several times. I've taught individually. Tyler's taught a lot individually. Um, but one that um, this is our first time actually doing, doing together. That's right. So a um, little bit more about myself. I've been in the DME industry for uh, over 20 years, been on all kind of sides uh, as a manufacturer, as a provider. I'm a resident certified ATP and SMS. Um, I presented this course uh, at ISS um, and then kind of all over as well. Uh, just a few personal things about me. Um, born in Sitka, Alaska. I'm actually a member of the Clinkett Indian tribe. Um, this is my family up here. We're, we're uh, Disneyland uh, junkies. This is just a recent trip we did here just a couple weeks ago. I uh, live in Lake Stevens. I've got uh, boy-girl twins, 10 years old, and that's my 14-year-old. Um, and I love anything outdoors. Love love uh, camping and, and fishing and just doing anything outside. My name is Tyler Shrink, and I am the founder, CEO, and president of Tyler Stay at Home Son. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm involved with a nonprofit foundation called the TSF that helps individuals with disabilities use technology to be independent, as well as a business called Assistive Technologies Consulting, which does much of the same thing. For fun, I like to race my chair around the house like a Formula One racer. I like baseball. I like accessible hikes, and I like shopping. So that's a little bit about me, and we will start talking about assistive technology next. All right, so we're going to go over some learning objectives. This is the only slide that I read, uh, read verbatim. We've got a lot of stuff to cover, so uh, let's get to it. So we're going to uh, do several things. One of the things, the goals when we developed this was to really give you some practical skills um, and, and give you some kind of tangible things to take away with you. Um, instead of just, you know, we, we, I, I've seen several of these where, you know, we talk about what's possible, but we never really show you how to do it, okay? So uh, today we're going to establish Bluetooth connection between iOS uh, and Android devices and power wheelchair drive controls. We're going to talk about four key technologies that have the potential to increase function and independence for users. We're going to describe and apply three different apps that can be beneficial for addressing participation limitations due to disabilities, set up program run three different switch control strategies on iPhone devices, identify three different alternative funding sources that may pay for universal design technology, and explore and list two benefits of commercially available mounting options for phones and tablets on mobility devices. A lot of them. Yep, that may seem like a lot, but we're going to walk you through it. <laughs> All right, so this slide is a little bit tongue-in-cheek. The, the idea here is that this is, you know, when we talk about accessibility, we're, we're trying to get people to think of accessibility in a different way, right? Think of, you know, we, when we hear the word accessibility, a lot of us think of things like curb cuts and uh, the ADA, you know, physical mobility ramps and elevators. Um, what we're trying to get people to think of is in this new world that we're in today, uh, kind of the Internet of Things connectivity is really thinking about accessibility in a, uh, in a new way. So assistive technology can be anything, really. Uh, if you're wearing eyeglasses, that's assistive technology. But it can all be all the way to robotics or uh, virtual reality. Accessibility means more today than just providing mobility, uh, interactive environments. The impact of technology and the end user is really significant. I will tell you a little bit about why that's important to me. There is a law for rehabilitation assistive technology, so it's available and should be discussed. So this is the this is why we're here. Okay, the the problem is is that you know this, this technology is out there can have great benefits for people. Um, you know the the benefits are are really um, there. There's a lot of them, but there's some kind of hurdles in the way. Okay, so. One of the biggest things is that these devices are not considered medically necessary, right? So they're not, right. you know, our traditional funding sources, our Medicares and Medicaids don't readily pay for this type of equipment. Um, because care providers, and, and by care providers that can be a, you know, a vendor, uh, an OT, a PT, because we're not reimbursed to really help implement, train, program, troubleshoot this type of technology, 
um, it, it kind of gets, you know, we get this, well, that's really not my, yeah. my role. That's, you know, that's something maybe you should do. There's kind of this, um, you know, nobody really knows who should be talking about this stuff. Um, very time consuming, okay? It's been viewed as very, very time consuming. Um, you know, this equipment we're gonna talk about today, a lot of these components are commercially available. The, you know, the, the rate at which this stuff is evolving, there's new software coming out and new versions of things. Um, you know, we go out, we set this stuff up, and then what happens when, you know, the version changes and it, it, it doesn't work like it used to. Right? Absolutely. So there's kind of this ongoing right. service. Yeah, and all of us struggle with technology, and so for educators or therapists, try to teach the person how to troubleshoot it themselves because there will be issues. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate this stuff isn't more readily available through funding sources, but it is consumer technology as that's what's gotten these things uh, available and affordable for people like me. Yep. So because of these, you know, the lack of, uh, lack of funding, the knowledge deficits, they, you know, what, what has traditionally happened is there's been kind of a limited number of subject matter experts in the field that we've relied, a lot, right, relied upon as a community, as an industry, to go out and to help kind of enable some of these connections and, and the things we're going to talk about today. Great. What, what the goal is is to really, you know, help you uh, leave here today with the, you know, some different skills, you know, some knowledge where maybe you can go out and, and try to help, you know, provide a little bit of the foundation to, to make this stuff a reality for people. One of the things we want to make sure that people leave here today with is, you know, if we, as a, as a, as a community, as an industry, and this is something that I think we all kind of, we all espouse is, you know, let's not, let, let's make the case for things, right? Let's, it, even if we know that something, hey, that's going to be categorically denied, we know that there's no funding for it, um, there's still a benefit, I think, to letting our payer sources know that the benefit of how this stuff is making lives better, right? Um, if we never ask for it, my perspective is that our, our funding sources, the, the, you know, potential payers for this type of equipment just never really know, right? It's just, well, we don't hear anything, so it's not something that we need to really consider. Um, I, I talk about, you know, the, this is not something where you need to really, you don't need to build the whole skyscraper. Okay, this is something where if you can just establish, you know, help somebody establish a connection, um, let them know what, what some of the possibilities are. The, you know, if people are motivated by this type, type of technology, they will, they will build this out themselves. Okay? A good example could even be just a light bulb controlled with an Amazon Echo. It's cheap, you know, $30 for an Amazon Echo, $25 for a Bluetooth light bulb, and it's just something that can be done independently. It doesn't have to be much, just anything. Yeah. Um, there are some there are some funds out there, and these are you know these are several. There's probably this is not a comprehensive list, but there's several that um, here that you can you can rely on. You know these are ones where a lot of times you're doing an application, a grant application. Um, Tyler's Foundation often pays for this type of assistive tech. Um, you know the VA, Google, Micro, I mean Google and Microsoft and Amazon. This is really a, a, a burgeoning industry right now, right where. They're trying to make things that have universal design um, characteristics, and, and they're getting this stuff out into the market so that everybody can use it. Um, Tyler, you wanted to share just kind of your journey a little sure. bit here, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of kind of the spark that you had, mm -hmm. you know, and, and. Yeah, absolutely. One thing real quick, all you power wheelchair users out there, you're all eligible for a $550 assistive technology benefit per year. So you gotta ask your caseworker, they're probably not gonna tell you, so you gotta let them know. It's more paperwork, so you're probably not gonna hear about it yourself. Anyways, so back to technology, and uh, I had a spinal cord injury in 2012, obviously left me paralyzed from the neck down. And for years, I just dealt with social anxiety and depression. You know, I really didn't do much except watch TV, eat, sleep, you know, eat, sleep, TV, repeat, over and over for so many years. And what kind of changed that was, a friend of mine who was working at Microsoft donated a Microsoft Surface tablet. Um, and that was important to me because it didn't take up a ton of space. I was living in a small living room and I could do it by voice. So, uh, you know, I tried it out and I took to it right away. It, you know, I, all I did really at first was look at baseball blogs, but 
I was looking at something independently and it just really hit a spark for me and I was like, okay, I can do something on my own. I'm not reliant on others nonstop for everything. So from there, you know, like Corey mentioned before, it was, you know, I got interested in it and I kept adding on assistive technologies. Uh, I was controlling my TV with an Xbox and a Kinect, uh, changing the channels by voice. It wasn't what it was made for, but it can be used for, to help me. Uh, from there, got involved with nonprofit work because it really became my passion. Um, started a business doing the same thing. And it's amazing how many people want to be independent, but they just really don't know. So it's great to be able to pass along information like we're doing today. Yeah. One of the things, I think I might point this out in a later, later slide, but you know, when we're talking about the, the benefit of the stuff, especially as we're trying to make a case for why maybe it should be paid for, you remember, that you're, remember to talk Medicare, Medicaid's language, right? So I mean, what they're interested in is, is dollars and cents. So Tyler, I mean, you know, if we can, if we can, if we can detail, hey, we have, instead of, 10 hours of caregiver you know, a day, I've got six or four, right? I can be independent and safe and, and functional and, and do the things that I want to do and not have, you know, maybe not have caregiver there all the time, right? Right. So what we're going to focus on today is really uh, kind of four technologies. So, you know, we talked about the, the foundation. This is really the foundation. This is what we're going to, we're going to talk about. Uh, the first is home automation. Uh, getting access to a computer, being able to mouse, uh, a phone, tablet. The phone and tablet, I mean, really everything we're going to go into in terms of this little home kit over here, that's kind of my little mobile home lab. Um, I'm able to bring that, plug it in, and, and kind of give you an idea of how all this stuff works um, no matter where I'm at. As right? you can tell, Corey has excellent art skills. <laughs> <laughs> my little cat. Uh, um, and, then, uh, and then television. Uh, so, you know, entertainment. That, that one, entertainment, as Tyler mentioned, is a, is a tough one. There's, you know, spent a lot of time at Tyler's house and, and uh, others' homes and getting a sense for all the different things that, you know, people yeah. use. Absolutely. There could be a case to be made that there is a place for that in the journey um, back to work or independence. Once again, just something you can do on your own can lead to much more. Um, you know, listening to a song with an Amazon Echo or being able to control your TV independently could be the spark that leads someone to then use a computer and take it from there. So this is more of the skyscraper, right? So if we can get people, you know, the foundation of, hey, let, let's, you know, let's just show you how to connect via Bluetooth to your phone, right? Or just set up a very basic switch control protocol. Um, now we've got, you know, the ability to, to run a home via voice or through a, through a power wheelchair drive control. Uh, computer, mousing, um, you know, work, pay bills. I mean, you think of all the things, social media and all the things that that kind of opens up. Um, entertainment, so many different ways, right? There's streaming and gaming and, I mean, we all have, I mean, I think of just my TV at home. I can't even keep track of all the apps and I know. stuff that we've got on there. And passwords are the worst. <laughs> I can never remember those dang things. All right. All right. Voice control versus switch access. So voice control is something that is only controlled with your voice. So it's a direct one-to-one. -one. I'm telling my phone to open an app, make a Facebook post, or anything of that sorts. It can also be used to open and close doors. You can use voice control for door openers. You can use voice control for the computer. There's many different voice accesses for computer. Um, switch control is something that I would say primarily is used on a phone. And once again, for you power wheelchair users out there, you just switch modes on your wheelchair. So rather than driving it, you are operating um, an accessibility app on iPhone that lets you control your phone just with your joystick or sip and puff or whatever you do to drive your wheelchair. Yeah. Switch control, the way, you know, one of the ways I try to explain switch control is. I mean, if you think of your iPhone, your phone that you have right now, anything that you can tap, swipe, hit, open, run, right, anything at all, any program, any application, I, I can, if I can establish a connection between a, a power chair and, and any type of power chair, any type of joystick or, or 
head array or sip and puff, it does not matter the type of drive control. Um, if I can just establish a Bluetooth connection with that phone, I can then run every single thing with a, with a power wheelchair drive control, okay? So the, you know, just a couple things, I mean, you know, one of the things obviously, you know, some, some people, and, and I, you know, we, we talk about this presentation and this technology to all kinds of different diagnoses, right? I mean, there are a lot of diagnoses we work with where, where it can kind of be expected, hey, this might be progressive. I can expect a year or two or, or however many months down the line this person might not be able to speak clearly enough to activate some of these devices, right? That might be where we really pay special emphasis to making sure that we have, you know, we train mm -hmm. well on switch control and that uh, we've got it running all the, all the devices the person wants. Yep, and there are more options coming out. A lot of the major tech companies really are trying to focus on disability. A good example would be on iOS, there is a sound control where you make yeah. a clicking sound to move to the next item. Or you raise an eyebrow, no, it's only voice sounds. Uh, you use, I don't know, you click your tongue, you make a, I know, a sipping noise, I don't know, all sorts of sounds just to move around your phone. So another great option. And within iOS and Android, there are many different kinds of ways to control your phone just in the accessibility settings. So I encourage everyone just to pop open their phone and check out and see what's in there. Yeah. Yeah, the, the cool thing with this stuff is, you know, it's really the Apples and Androids and Microsofts of the world that are driving this, driving this bus, right? I mean, this is stuff that, um, you know, this industry, like the, the industry you kind of see represented here, um, I mean, this benefit is coming from universal design and these, these tech companies that are thinking of new ways to, to do stuff, right? I, I always kind of um, talk about there's a, there's a device out there where, where people can drive with their eyes, right? So they did, it's called an eye gaze drive. Um, it was kind of a challenge that was given to Microsoft by Steve Gleason and said, hey, I, I want to be able to drive my power chair, but I, there's, like, I'm out of ways to do it, right? Microsoft took it. They did a hackathon. Within a week, they had a prototype. It's now a, it's now a business, right? That would have taken, I mean, it would have taken yeah. years and years and years, right? But Microsoft, I mean, the, the amount of brain power in places like this is phenomenal. Absolutely. All right. Phone slash tablet access. So as Corey mentioned, you know, phone, tablet, it really can open up everything to you. There's practically an app for everything. So if you can get a way to control your phone, it can open practically anything up. You know, communication, entertainment, whatever it may be. So there's, once again, options for voice control or switch access. There's eye gaze, like Corey mentioned. Uh, you know, those aren't practically expensive, believe it or not. Often they're on your phone. There's an app called Hawkeye Access for iOS. There's Talk to Speak on Android. And there is something called a Toby Eye Gaze Bar that you can mount on your computer. Yep. Hawkeye. Hawkeye. Hawk. Yep, you got it. Um, couple of specific programs apps that we wanted to point out. One is IFT. Anybody familiar with IFT? How about routines on the Amazon Alexa app? Okay, so, so what, what Tyler's talking about, the routines, this IFT protocol, um, what, these are, what these are meant to do, you know, when we are looking at a chair like this, right, we're always trying to, to, get, to get people as efficient as we can, right? We want to reduce the amount of, of commands and switch hits and, and, you know, instructions it takes to kind of move throughout your chair, move throughout whatever it is you want to control. So if protocol stands for if this, then that. So basically it kind of daisy chains a bunch of apps and commands together, okay? So Tyler can get home and, you know, the second he goes in, unlocks the door, right? Door opens. Yep. And instead of just the door opening, and now, now you go in and, you got to turn the lights on, turn the heat where yeah. you want it, turn the TV on, right? If we'll kind of chain all those things together. Absolutely. So I, I use GPS location. So when I arrive home, the door unlocks, and then the door opens, and then parks, stays open. So I can just come wheeling in without worrying about stopping or anything. 
And that's helpful if it's raining. You know, I don't want to be sitting out in the rain, you know, clicking around on my phone. So those are great options for things like that. Uh, the other one that I point out here is, and they may, you know, for, for today, maybe not quite as applicable, but I do point out, you know, speech assistant in AAC, there, is, there are so many um, speech apps on the Apple Store. They cost $2, $5, $10. They're super simple. For, for people that, you know, when I, when I present this to like the ALS Association, um, you know, instead of if you're familiar with like a big speech OGCOM device, they're, they're huge, they're expensive, they take a long time to train on. I can take a phone, I can go on the Apple Store, buy a $5 app, hook it up to a joystick, a head array, a, a sip and puff, whatever it is, and, and have somebody saying, you know, I'm tired, I'm done for the day, I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, I, that doesn't feel good. Um, right? Whereas mm -hmm. it might take me months with a kind of traditional speech generating device. Absolutely. Another example of that, as I mentioned, talk to speak. You know, you just move your head and it'll say, I want water. Simple things like that. So iOS versus Android. Android uses open source software and the setup and experience often aren't consistent. Um, it can be difficult just to get to some of these outcomes Corey and I described. iOS, uh, I would say, kind of started this more or less. What do you think? The accessibility things, and they have a great accessibility system built in. You know, I think they were the first ones doing switch control. Uh, I believe they had voice control maybe before Android, and it's really refined. So if anyone were to try an iOS phone and an Android phone, you'd have much more luck using the iOS. Um, accurately controlling, moving around, all sorts of things like that. Yeah. And this is, you know, obviously this is our subjective opinion, right? But the one thing I, it was not subjective at all, is that when you get into an iPhone, it always looks the same, right? I mean, it uses iOS, you got the same operating system, I could take anybody's iPhone in here, and I know exactly where to go. With Android, you know, I get a Google phone, you have a Samsung phone, you know, the, the experience is, is very different, right? It just it looks a little bit different. The you know the things it just it does not kind of handle the same way. Yeah. So I use both. I have a maybe the one person in the world that has a Microsoft Duo cell phone. So I put around in that. And uh, the worst thing about it is using speech recognition. It picks up all the background noise. iOS has a really great just listening to you, and you don't have crazy things you know coming out of your messages, you know. <laughs> Some of the things that, I, don't, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I once proposed sex to my banker. I was trying to say tap six, and it said tap sex. Oh, uh, yikes. So. Uh, all right, so mounting options. This is one that uh, a lot of people ask questions on. How do I, how do I just you know, put these things on chairs? We have a company right here in Seattle. Ram, Ram Mounts is based right here in Seattle. Um, I've, if anybody out there has a different you know, experience, I have... Um, I feel like they, they did a really, really good job. They obviously brought people in that, that were very familiar with this space and with the types of chairs that things were being mounted on. They have a whole wheelchair solution builder. It has you tell, you know, do you want to, are you in a permobile, an Invicare, are you mounting it off of a seat rail or an armrest? Um, and then it tells you exactly what you're going to need. It's all available right on their website, so. Yeah. Very user friendly. And uh, you know, if anybody isn't familiar with this company, they make all sorts of mounts for fishing boats and semi trucks. I mean, they're 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 in every space where you need to mount a phone, a tablet, computer. Um, very robust, easy to use, and most of all, um, commercially available. Right? This is not you're not buying a mount from a wheelchair company or from a medical right where it costs ten times as much and Right, this thing you can buy it and have it at your on your doorstep tomorrow. Okay, so let's talk about home hubs and smart speakers. So, um, what one thing I didn't talk about? You know, we when when we were putting this thing together, I spent a lot of time with Tyler. Uh, we actually took a, a, a kind of an empty we had an empty office space down in Bend, Oregon, and we built out a kind of fully automated home automation environment okay and we brought in we had Google home you know Google home we had Cortana we had all kinds of different home hubs Apple home kit and basically got a chance to really 
try everything, right? Like like spend, you know, spend a week, two weeks, three weeks, just just seeing how things kind of worked. Um, home hubs, and this is, <laughs> these are a little bit my terminology. Okay, um, what do you call them? Swear words. <laughs> <laughs> they never work quite right. <laughs> um, when I think of a home hub, I think of something kind of really full featured, right? And, and these are some examples. Uh, Wink, Samsung makes their smart things, Logitech Harmony, Apple HomeKit. There's ones I've been doing a lot of research lately. There's a whole other world out there of, of home environmental control units that are, you know, kind of specialized, dedicated to like the smart home automation industry. Um, these ones I would say are kind of your most commonly known one, right? There, there are a lot of other ones that are, you know, I think they'll run your sprinklers and your mm -hmm. security. I mean, they'll really run practically anything. Yeah. Um, but I felt like, you know, we were trying to kind of keep this somewhat commercially available, right? Some of those kind of professional systems are a whole nother, it's a whole nother ballpark. Um, the smart speakers are your, your, your Amazon Alexa, Google Home, Microsoft Cortana, just your basic little smart speakers, right? I'm sure a lot of you probably have these devices in your home right now, okay? They cost 20, 30 bucks, 30 bucks yeah. right? Um, rely on voice automation, but, but the app, so the apps that they have, and I'm going to show you here in a little bit, we'll actually look at my phone, we'll be running this little home kit through, a, through, a, through that chair, it's the app, you know, you were talking about the routines. Yes, right? the Amazon Alexa app. So that Amazon Alexa app is where I'm going to go to actually run this through, um, through, the, through the power wheelchair drive control. So interested individuals also can check out the Harborview Assistive Technology Lab. And it has many of the same things Corey described for the one in Bend, Oregon. Yep. I'll let you take over, getting dizzy again. Are you? Okay. Please. Um, so what, what I wanted to say about smart speakers, you know, we, we, we spent all this money, we had all these different home hubs and all this stuff, and we had all these different options, we tried them all. At the end of the day, it, it really, we, we really couldn't find any great reason, um, that, you know, anything that these would not do. These $20, $30 devices were very simple to set up, very simple to talk to, to interact with. Uh, the, the Amazon Alexa skills and routines Just and devices, right. all the things that you can do in that app, really, by, by the end, we're like, well, I, don't, I mean, I'm not really sure what some of these kind of fuller featured hubs are, are doing that a basic home, you know, smart speaker like this isn't. Um, anybody out there have any different experience where, hey, I use something different because it does something that Alexa doesn't? No? A great evolution. Oh, go ahead. I have an answer to the question. I remember playing Tetris when I was a kid. We had the OCD, you know, like products. Yeah, I have noticed compatibility issues when it comes to connecting between like Apple and Google and Android. Uh, Apple, like, like you mentioned, was specifically difficult. The thing that I have difficulties with is when connecting them, you often have to scan the barcode on the home item, the smart outlet or whatever. And I always am in a hurry and I just toss the box out and have to go rummaging through the garbage later to try to find it. So a lot of the other ones are great where it just automatically connects it through Bluetooth. So. I Go ahead. I, I, I was good. I mean, you know, I built. I mean, I built this thing. I mean, what I what I've got here. I've got an iPhone. I've got a Echo Dot, which is Amazon Alexa. My opinion. I mean, that that combination feels pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of skills on the Amazon app, so that is kind of like IFTTT, where it's connecting two items together, but they're already pre-programmed in Alexa. So imagine a smart switch like Wemo. Um, you just download the Wemo skill in the Alexa app and enter in your passcode and it automatically connects the two. They're inexpensive and easy to install. They're constantly evolving. Now they have these smart speakers with screens, which can do even more. Um, 
automatic drop-ins. So imagine a elderly parent who you want to check in with every once in a while. You can automatically force a video feed in <laughs> and check them out. I can think of all sorts of things that can be troublesome. I actually did it to my caregiver, Charles, yesterday on my way home. I just pulled it up. Hey, Charles. <laughs> startled the heck out of him. So, yeah. I'm trying to think about what my grandmother would do if yeah. that just like patched in all of yep. a sudden. But there are concerns with privacy. I'll let Corey take over with that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, did, I, was, I forgot about that. Um, you know, these things are listening all the time, right? And, and I'm not smart enough to know where, where, where the data goes, what happens. Um, you know, for some people, this is a big concern. Others are, hey, you know, this stuff is so pervasive and everybody's got it. And, um, you know, I trust Jeff Bezos with my, my information. That's right. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of, you know, wherever you fall in that spectrum. Um, I will say some, you know, there are some healthcare systems, and I don't know, I, I believe that Harborview has some of these in their, in their connectability lab. Um, I'm getting some skeptical looks, so maybe not. <laughs> but, um, you know, in, in, the, in the, the lab that we built down at Ben, we had, a, we had a, you know, a release of, hey, listen, let's not discuss social security numbers and, and private health healthcare information that you don't want heard, right? right? I will say on the, on the Amazon front, um, I actually just learned the other day, they do, have, they do have kind of a, like a HIPAA compliant version of this. I, I'm still, I'm not sure yet, is that, is it a totally different device? Is it, is it like a different software that's in there? I'm not 100% positive on that yet, but. Yeah, it's usually in like the terms and conditions type of thing where you just change how the software runs, I believe. Like I said, it's fairly new. It could be completely wrong, which yeah. isn't uncommon for me, but you know, <laughs> what the heck. Home automation. So this is my favorite one. As I mentioned, um, you know, assistive technology really changed my life and brought me a ton of independence. Uh, you know, while this was going on, I was living in my dad's living room and I had an opportunity to move out on my own, but I was gonna have to solve many problems of how to be independently when I was in my home because I wasn't gonna have someone with me constantly. So we started with, you know, a Wemo, just a way for me to control devices like a fan or anything that you just need power to and you leave it in the on position. August smart locks are great. I use those to lock Corey out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> Can do be done by voice, app, or you know, uh, with IFTTT and programs like that, uh, GPS location. Home lighting, there's, this is one's kind of interesting and there's several different ways to approach it. So there are Bluetooth light bulbs that you just screw in and replace your old light bulb and you just uh, connect it via Bluetooth between your phone and the light bulb. But there's also smart light switches. So that's when you would wire in a light switch to your wall and it would communicate with the lights that way. Uh, benefits of that is for me, if I have like the Bluetooth light bulbs on and the caregiver turns off the light switch, they are off. I can't turn the light switch back on and I can't get power to the light bulb. So smart switches, wall switches are a good way to bypass that. Yeah, but yeah, you want me to go back? We're actually, this is kind of, I probably, this is kind of a summary slide. We're gonna kind of go into this stuff in a little bit more detail. Is that okay? Okay. Um, so what I, what I use on this when I just have a Wi-Fi light bulb, hey Alexa, turn the light off. What do you mean light isn't responding? Hey, <laughs> I called it the wrong name. Hey Alexa, turn lights off. Okay. Um, the, uh, as Tyler said, the switches, I mean now you've got, I mean I, I get a little leery around my switches getting in there and playing with wiring and shutting my circuit breaker off probably something I have an electrician do, whereas, you know, I can just unscrew a light bulb and put a new one in. But these Wi-Fi light bulbs are not, I think they're maybe 20 a piece, yeah. 15 a piece. Fairly cheap. Often you get a deal on them where they come in a pack of four. Uh, they change colors now for people who are interested in that. All, pro all programmable by your phone app. Smart outlets. Once again, great for something you can leave on. So a fan, just plug the outlet in, pair it to your phone, leave the fan in the on position, and there you go. Hey Alexa, 
Turn the fan on. Okay. That's a $5 fan I bought off Amazon, what I'd call like a dumb device, right? Plugged into a smart Wi-Fi enabled outlet. Mm -hmm. Heating and cooling. Um, you can replace your thermostat with something like the Ecobee Nest. Yeah, Nest is one of the options where you once again can use the app on the phone and by voice to change the heat in your home, the entire home. There's also options for just like one room. There is a Dyson Link space heater that is controlled by voice that does heat and fan and you can change the, change the temperature and fan speed all by voice or with your app. I'd say that probably most of you, if we you know, look at all these devices we're kind of talking about, this is probably a component that I would see most often in your homes. Like a lot of people are going to this type of, you know, this type of thermostat. I'll tell you myself, it's awesome, like driving home from Eastern Washington in the middle of the summer mm -hmm. and turning the AC on. Who wants to try and control Corey's house? <laughs> <laughs> Any hands raised out there? All right. Uh, hack in. Yeah. It's 40 degrees. Yeah, your little house too. <laughs> you can change the temperature for us. Uh, yeah. Hey Alexa, set the temperature to 71 degrees. All right, and I'll show you that how that works on the phone here in a minute too. Um, these things very simple too for just a do-it-yourself. I mean, they have great videos on YouTube, walk you through how to wire them up and put them. You know, this is something that I think a lot of people can probably yeah. handle. So my personal favorite, Open Sesame door openers. There is a company called Open Sesame, based a little outside of San Francisco, that has automatic door openers that are usually controlled with a little handheld button. You can mount, uh, you know, like what you would use, hit a button to open a door, going into the doctor or whatever, you can mount those near your door. But another thing we worked on um, several years ago was we were trying to figure out how I could open and close my door. My option from Open Sesame was much like the sip and puff a blow switch. And I just, I get so tired of having so many straws in my face. We really wanted to find another way. Uh, luckily, we found a smart gate opener that was compatible with the Open Sesame. So we wired that in and the app said I was controlling a gate, but I was really just controlling my door. So lots of different ways just to get creative and use assistive technology or home automation consumer products, not for the intended purposes, but still can help with independence. Yeah, it's a good example, you know, we talk about like just efficiency of commands and, mm -hmm. and uh, having a, you know, for you, I mean, having a switch, right? Yeah. Mounted, I mean, that does one thing is not really, it's not the best use of mm -hmm. real estate, nope. right? So being able to do it through the GoGo -Go gate opener, through an app on your phone is much better. Correct. Door locks, uh, as we mentioned, there's August. There's all sorts. I think all the companies have smart door locks now. You can do keypad. Uh, I have one that I can actually unlock it with my app. So if I don't want to give out my keypad number, someone can open the door. They uh, can be controlled by location, so when you get home, they can open just by your GPS location. Uh, you can control them with the app on your phone. You can control them with voice. And often, if you connect it with Alexa, and at night, let's say, you typically lock it and you forget, Alexa may give you a reminder to go ahead and lock your door or say, can I lock your door for you? Yeah. 5.30 p.m. <laughs> it's going to be going off now. I know. At least you didn't set it for 5.30 a.m. Yeah, I know. Um, a couple, couple things to, to remember about these, the door locks and the open sesame. The, um, these are, you know, if, like you open the door just like, just like normal, okay? So caregiver, family member, husband, wife, it, the, the door operates just like normal. This is on the back side, on the inside, turns just like a normal, you know, latch, right? So there's nothing here that doesn't operate as kind of we've, you know, become accustomed to. Yep. Right? We just have another way to use it. Kind of already touched on this, but garage door openers. There's the <coughs> Open Sesame, no, excuse me, the Go Go Gate, 
and the Nex opener. Uh, they differ in price a little. Nex is cheaper. The GoGo Gate's a little more expensive. Uh, but of course, they can be used actually for their intended purpose, like opening your garage door, um, which can be handy once again with GPS location. You just get close to your house and the garage door pops open. All right, computer mouse access. So this is one kind of like the, the television entertainment. There are a lot of different solutions that are out there. Um, mouse simulation is being built in, mouse connectivity. I mean, every chair basically now has kind of at this, you know, this level has connectivity Bluetooth built into it, right? So they're able to connect uh, to computers. Um, one important thing, I always get calls, hey, my, my mouse on my screen, it's going moving too fast or it's, you know, it's moving too slow or it's doing weird things. These computers do not recognize, they don't recognize the electronics on your, on your chair as anything other than a wireless mouse. Okay, so anything, you know, changing the way the mouse moves, the speed in which it moves, the way it moves, it's, it's pretty much always done in, in the control panel of the computer. Okay, so it's not like a, there's not often, you know, parameters around computer mouse programming in the chair. There's, there, there are some, but for the most part, that holds true. Um, clicks is always the, the tough part. You know, we can get people like, you just, you know, just moving the cursor proportionally, um, digitally all over the screen. It's okay, now what do we do when we get there? Do we, you know, do we have a, a, a dedicated switch for like left mouse, right mouse? Um, again, that's not realistic for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. A uh, great thing about that though is there are more apps coming out so talk to speak could be an example. You use your drive system to move the mouse, and then you program a click with the talk to speak app on Android, where you raise an eyebrow and it does the click for you. And that's fairly new. Like Corey said, for a while, there was no options other than trying to program a dedicated switch. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of you probably are familiar with this device, the Quad Joy. For a lot of, lot of people, that's probably the, the best way to, to run a mouse and have that clicking built in. Um, there's dwell click, that's been around for quite a while. You just let your cursor sit on an icon and after a programmable number of seconds, it opens it. Um, eye gaze is a, you know, the eye gaze has been around, the technology's been around for a long time, but it's starting to kind of find its way into, you know, we talked about driving power chairs. Um, these, you know, manufacturers are kind of incorporating eye gaze into other things. I think we're going to continue to see eye gaze operation. You know, Tyler talked about the, you talked about the Alexa screen, mm -hmm. right? Maybe having eye gaze incorporated into that where I can just look at the icons that I have on my screen and, and, uh, and run them. Absolutely. Uh, entertainment. So we've been talking about this all day, the, the kind of, you know, the, the variety of solutions that you might have, a lot of different things to consider. Um, a lot of chairs do have IR, infrared, so if you think of like your standard remote control, right, we can program chairs to be, to be able to kind of duplicate that signal. Often a great way to start with accessibility is what's built into the wheelchair, because you already have it, it's free. Like Corey mentioned, it can do IR, now it does Bluetooth. Yep. Um, uh, a really good one, there are some, you know, the different uh, cable and dish providers, they all have apps for remotes that you can put on your phone. Um, there are a number of really great apps on the App Store. I'll show you one here in a minute that I downloaded that's like specific to a Samsung TV. So part of the challenge, you know, TVs, you think of what they were 20, 30 years ago, right? It was like on, off, volume up, channel down. Now they're so much more complex, right? Um, the Logitech Harmony was one that we found, you know, at least in the lab thing that we did down south, was mm -hmm. more really kind of full-featured specific to entertainment. Yeah, it can be difficult to program, at least I found that experience, but it's fairly powerful where you could give a voice command or an app command and it would do all of your TV functions, turn it on, turn on the sound bar, turn down the lights, all such of those types of things. All right. My favorite part, definitely for sure, future of technology. Let's see if the video see if works. Plays. More than 12 billion non-institutionalized people living with a disability in the United States alone require assistance with one or more activities of daily living. Systems such as the Jayco robotic arm can be attached to a motorized wheelchair 
and augment a person's ability to perform general purpose tasks that they can't complete on their own. The Personal Robotics Laboratory at the University of Washington aims to extend the capabilities of general purpose robots to accomplish even finer grain tasks. Eating free from food is one of the most intricate manipulation tasks that humans perform. To initiate feeding, a person would switch the robotic arm from teleoperation mode to autonomous mode. The meal begins with the robot picking up a custom 3D printed fork that is docked on the wheelchair when not in use. From that point on, Ada can feed someone an entire meal with or without human intervention. The system integrates onboard sensors, electronics, and computation with the arm and wheelchair, enabling Ada to travel with the person. Robot assisted feeding requires robust, non prehensile manipulation of a deformable target that is hard to model. Humans adapt their approach to accommodate the shape and compliance of each forkful of food. Our lab designed ADA to follow a similar approach, using a combination of sensing, perception, planning, and control to successfully acquire and transfer various food items. The camera and tactile sensor attached to the arm rely on a custom-built perception module to wirelessly communicate multimodal sensing information to the robot. The haptic feedback enables ADA to skewer with appropriate force and confirm the attempt was successful. Autonomous feeding is challenging for robots because it involves the manipulation of deformable food items of various sizes, shapes, textures, and compliance. A robot must solve the problem of both where to skewer and how to skewer each item of food, an act we refer to as bite acquisition. When deciding how to skewer, the robot must learn at what angle to approach the item, how to rotate the fork, and what forces to apply. Ada takes all of these factors into account when skewering a piece of food. For each item, whether it is a cube of melon, a whole round strawberry, or a soft slice of banana, the robot determines the appropriate fork orientation and approach angle then exerts the force required to successfully skewer and lift the item without dropping it. While a piece of melon can be skewered from above and safely lifted off of the plate, a soft food like banana requires Ada to approach from an angle that ensures the banana will not slip off the end of the fork in midair. Ada must also determine the best way to deliver the food to the person's mouth, which we refer to as by transfer. The combination of bite acquisition and bite transfer is straightforward for a compact item with fairly uniform dimensions. But that is not the case with longer items like a spear of celery or a baby carrot. For longer shapes, Ada will spear the item closer to one end rather than in the center. While this is not particularly necessary for successful bite acquisition, the system is also looking ahead to what will make the transfer easy in the next phase. At the point of bite transfer, Ada will position the fork so that the person can accept the food from the opposite end to where it is skewered. This keeps the tines of the fork away from the mouth, which, as we learned from user studies, is important for ease of bite transfer. The system also angles the fork in order to make it easier for the person to take a bite. The arm-mounted camera enables Ada to detect when a person has moved their head during the process of delivering the food item. The robot uses visual servoing to adjust its motion to the user's head movement. This enables it to adjust the path of the fork in midair to reach the person's mouth. When the plate is empty or when the person decides they have had enough to eat, Ada returns the fork to its dock on the wheelchair and the meal cycle is complete. At that point, the user resumes teleoperation until they activate the autonomous mode for their next meal. ADA represents a significant step forward in solving some of the most complex challenges in robot manipulation through a robust system of perception, planning, and control that is informed by multimodal feedback from haptic and vision sensors. With ADA, we have demonstrated the potential for a robot-assisted feeding system to increase independence and improve quality of life for people living with disabilities. For more information on the robot-assisted feeding project, visit us online at personalrobotics.cs.washington.edu. So the point of this robot, you may wonder, is to feed him. And not only feed him, do it autonomously. So there's a plate of food in front of him. 
rather than trying to control the robot with a joystick or for me a sip and puff, he would just give a voice command that says, give me a strawberry. And the robot would automatically know to go find that strawberry on the plate, pick it up, and not only pick it up, pick it up in the proper way because sometimes foods are picked up differently depending on them, and then find his face and deliver the piece of food. Next slide. So more robotics. Robots for accessibility are available now. There are small finger robots called SwitchBot. So they're fairly inexpensive. And an example of that would be, for whatever reason, if you want to turn a button on and off, I'll use a situation that happened to me as an example. My wheelchair was just turning off completely on its own whenever. And I can't press the button to turn it back on. And when I'm by myself, that's a problem. So what we did is we just put a switch bot on my little screen here so I could give a voice or app command and it would just look like this little finger dealy would just turn the wheelchair right back on. <laughs> so that worked out great. Medication management, there are medication robots now that will automatically dispense your pills at any desired time. They're often uh, face recognition, so you go up to them and they won't dispense the meds for anyone else except for you. Feeding robots, like I mentioned, uh, robot arm and hand robots, an example would be the Canova robot, which is a really robust arm that you can control on your own to pick up items, get drinks of water, feed yourself, get very, very slowly, uh, all sorts of things. So self-driving cars are kind of an example of robotics. Those are coming. Uh, incredibly helpful for people with disabilities because there's really no way for us to get around. Uh, feeding robots, like you saw at the beginning slide there. So this is this is one example. This product, uh, this one down at the bottom here, um, is called the OB feeding robot. Uh, this has been on the market for a few maybe, years, two years. I was going to say more like a year. Yeah, it's really new. Um, but completely programmable. Um, really, I think in terms of, of feeding, probably kind of leading the. Mm -hmm. um, leading the charge there. Um, a lot of you might be familiar with this product. I think this is in the Canova arm, Correct. the one that was in that yeah. the video. That, um, you guys have probably seen this. There's one of the reps in the area, his name is Nathaniel. He's always at shows and different things, showing, you know, drinking yeah. water with it and mm -hmm. spilling it all over yeah. himself. Something interesting <laughs> is right now, it's not covered through Medicare, Medicaid, but we're hoping to change that. Uh, there's an, a user has an appeal coming up soon. And if that appeal goes through, it would set precedent where more individuals would be able to get it. It is covered by private insurance most of the time and is almost always covered through the VA. Yep. Um, and like all the stuff we've been talking about, can be run, I mean, really designed to be run through a power wheelchair drive control. <laughs> I will say, <laughs> the, while the switch bot is affordable, the Canova is not affordable. is not affordable. It's like 70000 so you want a new Mercedes or a robot <laughs> arm? Honestly, I'd pick the Mercedes. <laughs> Sist of robots for tomorrow. Uh, no video here, but that arm you see, um, I'm picking up a cup of water, uh, all using my sip and puff uh, little straw that I use to drive my wheelchair. I just switch modes. And I reach out there, snag that cup of water, and bring it back. Uh, you know, this really could be the future of things. There are robots now that can actually help you prepare a meal. A lot of this is done in Asia. Self-driving cars, once again, really cool. Um, hopefully there'll be a day where I could just summon a car and wheel in it, into it and go where I want. Uber does have an option for uh, you know power wheelchairs to drive around. <clears throat> it's a pilot program. It may be over, but it was only located to downtown Seattle. Virtual and augmented reality. Um, you know, this can be used for so many different purposes. A lot of uh, virtual reality has been used just for relaxation techniques for people with disabilities. There is uh, studies done for autism and how it can improve that. Augmented reality is when you maybe have, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Microsoft HoloLens. You can still see your environment but there is an option for, I guess, HoloLens, there's an overlay. So I can be looking at all of you and maybe have the presentation in front of my eye. 
So it's like right in, it's like Google Glasses kind of, but bigger. There uh, you know, are smaller examples. There is one that kind of wraps around your head, and there's just a little lens on by your eye, like Robocop or something. And you can fully access a computer through head movements and voice. All so, right. Yeah, let's move on. So what I'm going to show you now, I'm going to actually, we're going to plug into my phone here. Okay, so you can kind of see what, so this is where it gets a little, gets a little fun here. Okay, so this should work. Okay, so I'm going to show you where kind of all this, you know, where the magic kind of happens here. So we're going to go into the accessibility settings. We're going to go down to switch control. Okay, and what I've done here, I've actually, I, I had this phone programmed. I'm going to actually go in. I, I went and actually deleted one of my commands. I'm going to go to switches here, and I'm going to put, you see I've got back, forward, left. I, I had removed right just to show you how I'm going to program this in here. This phone is already Bluetooth connected to this power chair over here. Okay, the, the Bluetooth connectivity, and, and I, you know, the, these chairs are meant for, for people, users, family members to do this. Okay, this is not something where a, an ATP, a tech, has to come out with a programmer and do it, right? They, they put this user accessibility stuff in the, in the joystick where you can access it yourself, okay? So I'm going to say add new switch. I'm going to click external. And I'm going to give this joystick a right command. And you're going to see my phone pops up and says, OK, I, I heard something. Like I, I, got that, I got that signal. What do you want that to be? OK, I'm going to name this. I always just name it the direction that I went. And now it says, what do you want to do? What do you want that, that command to do on that joystick? So okay. many options. It doesn't have to be moving around. It could be going to actually a specific web page if you were getting to Siri shortcuts. But more likely, it could just move home, back to the, your main page on your phone, open the app switcher, stuff like that. But here, Corey will just click back. So I'm going to choose move to next item for right. That's typically, this is kind of a normal setup that I would do, forward to select or kind of grab, enter, right? Uh, left, go, go previous, right, go, go kind of forward. Uh, move to next item, and, and then back is kind of a, a, a way that I can quickly get back to home. Okay, so I've got these I've got these programmed on there now. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to go up here. See, it says switch control there. I'm actually going to turn switch control on. Okay, so now you can kind of see what this looks like. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this joystick right and left. You can see that moving back and forth. Um, if, I, if there was an app that I wanted to get into, so let's say I'm going to get into the Alexa app, I'd give it a forward command to actually go into that row. Okay, now a right and a left move me left and right. Okay, so I'm going to go into Alexa, and right now, so I'm going to go back. I'm going to say I want to turn my lights on and my light turned on okay so this would be you know I'm moving this joystick around it'd be great if you could kind of see the commands I'm giving it but you can see how it's kind of working on the phone right um, I want to show you so this is kind of the, the main home page where I can access kind of everything. I've got my plugs, my lights, and this would, you know, in Tyler's phone, this probably looks a lot different. You've got yeah. like a multitude of things on there. Too many. But, <laughs> and it doesn't have to be Amazon products. So uh, even though it's the Amazon app, it's really any product you're using for accessibility. Um, I wanted to show you this app real quick. This is that, that uh, speech app I was telling you about. volume is turned down. Amazingly, we've had almost everything work. Yeah. Technology right? is so unreliable. <laughs> I don't know why my phone's not saying that, but. Hmm. Um, anyways, anything else that 
you know, maybe like the example would be like the Comcast Xfinity app. That's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let me show you that. Let me show you that. So that, um, this app here, this universal remote. No, stop it. <laughs> okay. So this is that, um, this is the universal TV remote app that I was telling you about. This is kind of specific to Samsung. So you actually like enter in the model of Samsung TV you have and then some of these things will, you know, I think the idea is that it kind of gets you a more full featured connection to your, to your TV. Absolutely. Okay. So we got a couple minutes left. Uh, we're open for any questions. Drill. You got it, Drew. So I've had many issues with my Wi-Fi going out, which don't allow me to control lights and whatnot. Uh, you know, it's, it is what it is. There could be a case to be made for something like a switch bot then, where it's Bluetooth connected. You know, I mean, if Wi-Fi goes out for me, I'm, you know, trying to barrel through a wall or kick the door open with my foot rest. So, you know. That, that is a good point, though. I mean, you know, you just think of the... I mean, the frustration, just, you know, I, internet doesn't work, I can't stream, I can't email, whatever. I mean, now you've got all these things hooked up, and it's like, if they don't, if it's, it, Wi-Fi doesn't work, I'm, I'm screwed. It's not like I can't. I, actually, Bluetooth can run independently from Wi-Fi, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, pros and cons for each one. Questions? Uh, speech Assistant AAC. And that's one that actually came like highly recommended from, from the, um, uh, the ALS, the kind of the technology guru over there that, hey, this is the one that we use for, like, we need a speech app today. Or for controlling a phone, voice control, um, voice access on Android. Windows is voice access. Apple, once again, is voice control for computer. Okay, what do we got? Go ahead, sir. So there is a $550 assistive technology benefit to individuals who receive state services through DSHS or the DDA. It is yearly for assistive technology. It's very underused. Uh, it can pay for an item, like a, you know, I mean, you're not going to be able to get a really nice iPad, right? But it'll pay for something in there. It also pays for training, installation, and uh, if you want to save some of that 550, you could use it for help in the future um, to get things set back up again. Unfortunately, it's fairly limited. There are a sex exceptions to the rule, which will pay for more money. But usually that's just uh, help from your caseworker submitting more paperwork, which gets shooted down to Olympia. So. That's your lock tap, right? Uh, no. It's no. just through DDA. Okay. Okay. Questions? Go ahead. I would say a great starting point is just this uh, phone for a great starting point for uh, new users or people who are intimidated by technology. Uh, you know, if you happen to be a power wheelchair user, like Corey mentioned, you have Bluetooth in your chair. Your phone has the accessibility features necessary. So it's really just connecting the two and going from there. Yeah, and, and I, I agree. I think, that's, I think that's the place to start. One thing that I, I think is, you know, you need, you need to make sure people understand is, you know, like you, you see me, I mean, I'm fairly fluent getting through and, and going where I want to go. But, but when you're using this every day, like Tyler, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's, he's just flying through it, yeah. right? I mean, there's, you know, he knows exactly where he needs to go. I mean, you get, you get so much more proficient at it when you're using it all the time, right? I mean, just the level of proficiency really gets extreme quick. And so for any, you know, educators or therapists, start with something the person isn't going to have trouble with because it can become discouraging and then you're losing you know maybe some of the more advanced things so something real simple like I mentioned the light bulb or if you do something on the phone something really simple there all right any more questions yeah uh oh 
<laughs> right. So go to places to troubleshoot troubleshoot <laughs> issues uh, would be well. I, I say that when I tr I have to deal with issues. So uh, places to troubleshoot issues would be the uh, you know Microsoft, Apple, Android all have dedicated help centers for disability features. There are chats and phone calls, as well as documentation. I think to Terrell's question earlier, too, it's probably something, I mean, why the Wi-Fi stability and reliability is such a big part of this stuff. It's probably something, you know, if, if, I, if I was relying on this stuff to work when I got home, you know, I would, I'd be telling Comcast, Xfinity, whoever my, my internet provider was, listen, this thing's got to work. I, I need you to, you know, I need you to help me here. You know, whatever it is, whatever we can do to my network, the, I mean, I, you know, the, the, the cabling, the router you put in, like, this isn't, for me, a nicety, right? This is a necessity. It's got to, I need a very reliable, consistent Wi-Fi system in my home. And I'd be, I'd be asking for any, you know, any ideas, help, assistance you can give me. Yeah. Be, I'm, no, I was, I guess, bashful for, a lack of better words at the beginning. I didn't want to ask for help. Now I have no problem doing it. I just go in there like a bull in a china shop and just <laughs> say, you know, we got to do something here. Please help. Um, people are much more uh, interested in helping now than maybe they were 10 years ago. So don't be shy. You know, ask for help. You're usually going to find someone to help you. If you get a bad representative, hang up and try again. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you.